to continue to look at um, CSS and images today. We're going to dive a little more into those two topics today. So what I like to, yes, question? Okay. Just waving your arms about, that's okay. Um, we are going to uh, review the example that we did last time to see if there's any questions with it, and then we'll build on it. So let me download the example from Angel so that we can take a look at it, and then we can build upon it. Yeah, go ahead. I, I don't do that for, for simplification. The, the question is, is, uh, is there's like a declaration that says the language is English at the beginning and the character set is UTF or something like that, yeah. right? Yeah, that, that's in the book. Uh, for simplicity, I just haven't been doing it, but it's probably a good idea to do it. Okay. All right, let's look at the example that we had last time. My tribute to fall. Question? Yeah. Yes? The left screen is all blue. And, and so, are, are you seeing the computer? Okay. Are you seeing it now? Yes. So we're all set now? Okay. All right. So here is uh, what we have. Now, one thing that a lot of people run into, and, and I, I get usually uh, you know, a couple emails a week, is people will say that they'll take one of my examples or they'll take the file that they turned in when they zip it up, and they run it, they open it up in a browser, and like in this case, oh, the image doesn't work. Or sometimes the links don't work. The reason for that is, is you can't view the pages from within a zip file. You have to extract it first. Um, a zip file <coughs> is where they take and they pack a bunch of files into one file. That makes it easier to send it, and there's some compression involved in, in the whole bit. However, it, you then lose the individual files when you do that. So there's only one file here, even though it looks like there's two. There's only one compressed file. <clears throat> you have to extract the files in order to see them. So we'll go up here and say extract. And now we have the folder and within that folder we have actually have the two files so we can go and look at it and there is our image back all right let's spend a minute looking at this <clears throat> and then we'll enhance it even further open with I want to open it in notepad Okay, so we'll go in and we'll open up Notepad. This is, and again, there's a, there's a bunch of ways you can do it. This is probably the most straightforward. I'm going to open up the Notepad, and then I'll simply drag my file onto Notepad. And there you go. All right. Let me make the font bigger so everyone can... See it better? All right. Here we have what we have.
before. I have standard HTML head and body. Again, to the question that was asked before the class, the difference between an article and a body, um, this is a, a good example because I have three articles in here in this page. And I have only one body tag. The body tag represents everything that you see in the screen. An article simply represents one of the sections of the screen. Now again, in this case, <clears throat> I could just as well have made the article sections because, you know, this isn't really an article. I mean, if I had a little photo gallery, I could just as well call it a section instead of an article. <coughs> All right. Header, article, I have my headings, H1, I have my unordered list with the list items. The one new tag that we did last time is an image tag. And the image tag allows us to show uh, images on our page. And the image tag itself is IMG. But notice again, we don't have the greater than sign there. The whole image tag is from here to here. All right. Included within virtually every image tag, there's going to be two attributes. Now we've we've seen the the uh, an example of attributes before when we looked at links. Um, with links, you have the href attribute. The href attribute de defines what the page is a link to, right? I can't simply say I got a link on my web page. Well, a link to what? I need to supply additional information. Same thing with an image. I can't simply say I have an image on the page. An image of what? Well, I ain't going to tell you. Well, it's not going to display then. All right? You have to specify the file name of the image um, that you want to display. And the SRC attribute is how you do that. So in this case, src equals fall.jpg. Because there's nothing in front of fall.jpg, there is just the name of the image, the assumption is, is, that the, is that it's in the same folder as the web page. So in this case, notice here's my folder for fall. The fall HTML document and the fall JPEG are both in the same folder. Now, it might not be obvious that, the, that this is HTML and that is the JPEG because we are still hiding the file extensions. We always, okay, we always want to show the file extensions because we need to know the precise name of the image. And the precise name of an image consists of the full name of the image consists of a combination of the file name, the first part of the name, and what's called the extension. And the extension defines the type of file it is. Again, this is different in every operating system, but if you go up to Organize and Folder Search Options, View, I can click off where it says Hide Extensions. And there I see that the, that the fall is fall.html, that's the web page, and this is fall JPEG, JPG, all right? Remember, JPEGs especially are problematic because a JPEG could be a .jpeg, a .jpg, or even a .jpe. So other file types aren't quite as problematic, but JPEGs are especially um, uh, especially confusing because of that. So I turn the extensions on. And again, if I don't get that right, like if I put in JPEG instead of JPG, I'm going to get a broken image. I can't find it because it doesn't have the full file name. So first thing you should do if you have an image and you're not seeing it on the page is first of all, Verify, at least for now, verify it's in the same folder. Later on in the term, we'll talk about ways that we can put these images maybe in their own folder. 
all right, to, to make our website a little more well organized. But um, for now, we'll put everything in the same folder, and then you just need to have the file name. But you need to have the complete file name, and that's the second thing to look at. Make sure you're showing the extension so you can see is it .jpg or .jpeg. We'll go back to this and we'll correct it. And we're back in business. Now the other thing, <coughs> the other attribute, the other additional piece of information that you want to have for your images is what's called an alt attribute. And alt attributes make the page more accessible for people with disabilities specifically blindness because people that are blind obviously can't access web pages the same way we do they can't look at a screen in a browser it's interesting I did um, a fellowship at NASA back uh, several years ago and I was just there for like 10 weeks during the summer and I shared an office with a, with a high school girl who was blind all right and the same kind of thing. They have it, they have it for both faculty and for, for students. So she was working, and she did work on the computer. She browsed the internet. She would make PowerPoint presentations. She'd do everything that you would expect a high school internet or a high school intern to do, you know, uh, uh, on a computer. But she never could see the screen once, right? I would come in in the morning, you know, me being sort of a late riser, all right, I would come in and she, of course, was already there, right? She's probably been there for a couple hours already, right? But I would come in, the room would be dark, the office would be dark, and that was kind of weird. She'd be sitting in a dark office, which, why turn on the lights if you can't see, right? You know? So she was sitting in a dark office. Sometimes her monitor would even be off, and she would be sitting there working away. And it, 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 was, it was a little odd, but... The thing is, is that there's assistive technology that reads the screen to you. Later on, we have a unit on accessibility where we'll talk about some of these things in more detail. And it may sound hard to, gee, let the screen, you know, let self, some software read the screen to you and that's how you're supposed to interact. Well, you do what you got to do, right? I mean, they don't really have any other choice if they want to uh, use a computer. And so she was very successful navigating her way through the computer using um, just the screen reading software. So the bottom line here is the alt attribute is one of the things that you can do on a web page to make your page more accessible. We won't necessarily see it, all right? Um, so a couple people have said, well, I put it in there, like in lab. They said, well, I put the alt attribute in, but I don't see it. Well, you won't see it because it's not meant for you to see, it's meant to be read by assistive technology. So every image that you have, you should have a source and an alt attribute. The other thing as a note for this class, you should give, unless you took the image yourself, you should give credit to where you got the image from. And in this particular case, I looked for stuff licensed under Creative Commons licensing, which is a more flexible form of licensing. Now, the second thing we talked about last time was cascading style sheets, or CSS. And that is another language that we use in web development. First of all, right now, our cascading style sheet is embedded as part of the HTML document. Later on, we can put it in its own file, and there's some advantages to doing that. But for right now, for simplicity, we're going to keep everything in the one file. The style tag tells the browser, hey, I know this is an HTML document, all right, because of the document declaration and because of the HTML tag, but for this space between the start and end style tag, we are out of HTML land and we are into CSS land. All right? So that's what the style tag represents. Yes? Uh, 
Absolutely. A absolutely. The question was, is I have a style rule right now for H1. Could I have a style rule for H2s? And the answer is yes, I could. All right. You can specify a style for any HTML tag there is, and that HTML tag will get that style. And we'll come more, we'll talk more about that later on, because that is sort of just like the first step. Um, the, the, fir the C in cascading style sheets is cascading, and we'll talk about what that means as far as style sheets go and as far as how these things cascade down. All right, but yeah. A cascading style sheet is made up of a set of rules, style rules. And these style rules are of this form. This is a style rule. The first part of the style rule is what is called the selector. So in this case, the selector is H1. There's, a, there's several different kinds of selectors. This is probably the most fundamental one. This says every H1 on this tag, uh, on this page, every H1 tag on this page gets this style rule. And then, as was noted, I could put a different style rule for H2s and a different style rule for paragraphs and so on down the line. All right? And we'll play around with that a bit um, in, a, in a minute here after, after we go over that. You then have a set of braces, or curly brackets. And these curly brackets contain a series of attributes and values, pairs. The name of an attribute and the value of the attribute. And these are predefined. It's not something like that I made up. All right? So in this case, the attribute that I want to change about it is background. What do I want to change that background to? I want to change it to orange. And then I have a semicolon indicating this is the end of this part of the rule. Now I can add other rules to it. I could add other parts to this rule. I could say... color white. Well, the background color is the color of the background. The color is the color of the letters of the, of the text. So if I did this style rule, this would say all H1s will have a white text on an orange background. And then for as many different style rules as I have, I'll have the name of the attribute, a colon, the value of the attribute, and a semicolon to indicate the end of that portion of the rule. Now, <clears throat> we're using colors here because they're typically the most obvious thing to do. You can see at a glance that the color changed, whereas if I change the font, it might not be obvious G is at Garamond or Times New Roman or whatever. All right. So. Um, I, uh, the, the color, unless you happen to be colorblind, which is a consideration, um, the color is the most obvious one to change. Also keep in mind that sometimes for demonstration, I deliberately pick color combinations that are very obvious, all right? They're not meant to represent good color combinations to use, all right? So if I, if my next thing is, you know, um, purple text with a green background, you'll know <laughs> that I did that just to demonstrate um, how you can do that. So, selector, rule. And the rule consists of a set of attribute, colon, value, semicolon. For now, the only selector we're going to consider is selectors where we define the HTML tag that gets the rule. So, for example, H1. All H1s will get that rule. 
I could put it in for paragraphs or links or anything like that. Now, an important thing to keep in mind is the way your page is going to look is always a combination of what you define in your CSS plus the defaults of the browser. So I've only, I've only set colors for one thing on my page, my H1s, and yet the paragraphs are going to be white with black text on it, the links are going to be blue and underlined, and so on down the line. Well, where does that come from? That's the browser defaults. So the browser already has a certain set of defaults. So if you put zero CSS on your page, the browser has to know what to make it look like, right? It has to know how to display it. However, the CSS allows us to override that and say, no, I know that H1s are normally black text on a white background, but I want mine to be white text on an orange background. So let's go and look at the revision. And we'll see, now I have white text on a black background, or on an orange background. And again, link, blue and underlined. I never said anything about a link being blue and underlined, but it's blue and underlined because that's the default of the browser. So. Let's go in and let's change the way the link looks. All right. Let's make it. Make the color of the text red instead of blue. So when we define a CSS rule, we're overriding the default of the browser. If we don't say anything, the browser follows a certain set of defaults. If we say something, the browser goes and takes what we've said and overrides it. Let me save this and view it. Oops. And now our link is red. Our links, rather, are red instead of um, blue. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and the question was, what if I wanted a one link to look a certain color and another link to look a different way? Um, that would be done by using different selectors. Remember, the HTML tag is just the first selector that we're going to look at. You can also select by ID, and you can also select by class. So if I wanted one H1 to look different, I could assign a class to it, or assign an ID to it, and then I would use that as a selector instead of the H1 tag. All right. Um, I'm not quite ready to go over that yet, but in, in a nutshell, that's what you'd do it. You'd use a different selector. You'd use a class or an ID, and then you could point to a group of things that you want to treat different than the standard H1, let's say, or one thing that you wanted to treat different than the standard H1. So it's done by simply altering the selector. Remember, the selector identifies what on the page gets this rule. And the, 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 in this case, the, the, the HTML tags, the H1s, and the As is just one of the ways that we can point to the things on the page and, and make the rule. All right, let's play around with this. We could do a style rule for H2s where we reverse this.
And there, notice that all of our H1s look this way. My H2 looks that way. All right. We could, and again, here's where we're getting into the realm of it possibly being ugly, but we could change the background color of the body. Yes. Yes. Now this will be our first example of the cascading part of cascading style sheets. So I'll put body in and I'll say background yellow. All right. That might be a little hard on the eyes, but we, we, we'll, we'll look at fine-tuning the color in a minute here. Now, here's where the cascading comes in, all right? Because I define a style rule of body, yet this list is also have a, has a background of yellow. Why, is, why does the list have a background of yellow? Because it's in the body, okay? Why doesn't, why isn't this yellow then? Because that's in the body as well. Because it has its own rule. So these rules cascade, all right, and they override each other. And the more specific you define a rule, that takes precedence. So I can define a rule to say everything in the body has a background of yellow. And then I say H1s have a different background in the color. Well, First of all, it will paint everything in the body yellow, then it will go in and apply the H1 rule to make that particular section orange with the white text. Yes? Does it matter what order? Does it matter what order? No. No. I, I, and, and it's funny because as I was saying that, I realized that that was maybe a confusing way to put it and make it think that people, have people think that maybe the sequence matters. No, it doesn't literally do it in that order, but We've defined the body is going to be that color. We've defined these sections. So the more specific, you know, the rule for the H1 is more specific to the fact that, oh yeah, this H1 is part of the body. And therefore, the more specific rule takes precedence. Okay, that's kind of a harsh color. All right, I don't, I don't really like that. Pardon me? That's pretty 90s. Is this 90s? I don't know. I lose, I lose track of, uh, of decades, I think. Really? Okay. So web design is good now, then, all the time. Well, better than the 90s. Maybe. It is, it might be that it is simply bad in different ways. All right. Okay. Anyhow, looking at this color, how do you know to pick yellow and orange and that worked? And if you remember last time I typed in Halloween orange because I didn't really read the web page closely enough and I thought that that was a legit color name. Well, the basic color names are going to be there for you. So like if I type red, it's there, white black, yellow, orange, purple, and all that. We can see a list of colors by Googling and paying attention to the results. HTML color names, and there's 140 names that are supported by all browsers. And these are examples. So maybe I don't want way down here is yellow. Maybe I want instead I have a uh, hundred forty other choice or hundred thirty nine other choices. Let's take let's try gold.
All right. Probably not much better, but I think a little better. It doesn't sort of pulse when I look at it quite as much as the other one does. All right, but we're still not there yet. Well, anyone that had the big 256 crayon box when they were a kid knows that there's more than 140 colors. How many colors are there? Mm, well, there's a lot. All right. So, does that mean that you can only use these 140 colors? No. There's 140 named colors, but you can specify colors using a set of codes that's different than the name. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the code and how that works, and I'm going to explain it. But the good news is, is like I heard someone say about gravity, the good news about gravity is it works whether you understand it or not. All right. So if you don't understand these codes, you can still get them to work for you. But I think it's important that you at least sort of have an idea how it works. Now, let me go and let me look up a different HTML color chart. Or actually, we'll use this one. Notice that this is gold. And next to it, they have this code, which is seven characters. Starts with the pound sign. Again, old timers call it the pound sign. Now, you, you, you youngsters might call it a hashtag. All right, but it starts with the pound sign, and it's FF D seven zero zero. So it's always a, it's typically a seven digit code. I can copy that, and that's simply another way of specifying a color. You can specify it via name, or you can specify it via code. Yes. Yes. And if we look at this, yeah, nothing has changed because we just use two different ways of expressing the same color. Now, you go to a paint store, right? Let's say you go to a paint store and you want to buy paint. How many paint colors will your Sherwin Williams store have? A bunch, right? Does that mean that they have 10 million cans of paint back in their warehouse? No. What do they do? They mix it. So they start with a white base, and if you want red, they'll go and they'll start with a white base and they'll add red pigment to it. And you got red. You want, a, uh, you want orange instead. What do they do? Well, they'll start and they'll add red and add yellow, and then you have the orange. Well, if you say, well, I want more of a blood orange, a reddish orange, well, they'll add red than orange. And they probably, I don't know, I never worked at Sherwin-Williams, but they probably have a recipe that says, if you want red, add this much red pigment to white paint. If you want orange, add this much red, this much yellow. If you want a blood orange, add this much red, you know, more red and a little less yellow, and so on down the line. So they have recipes that describe how much. They probably have only a handful of pigments that they piece together all the colors from. All right. In HTML, and again, this is sort of a physics thing, but in HTML, you can come up with and you can describe every color by mixing three colors and only three colors together. All right. How many of you remember back in the old days those projection TVs, the big screen TVs before they had the nice flat screens, right? If you looked at a projection screen, all right, you would see three lenses projecting and they were red, green, and blue. All right. And you could tell if something was wrong with them, like if the red lens was going, then everything might have a greenish blue tint to it, all right? Or if uh, they weren't lined up right, you'd see three images, all right, or something like that. Sort of the same idea with web development. We have three things. We have... Red, green, and blue. First of all, the power.
pound sign at the beginning simply indicates that we're going to be using the color code and not the color name. All right? Because we can express colors either by their name or by their color code. We then have our recipe for colors. And our recipe for the colors contains two characters for red, two characters for green, two characters for blue. So that's how we come up with the six digits. These digits can range, and as was, was asked in the class, they're hexadecimal, which means that unlike our decimal system where we have 10 digits, right, 0 through 9, in hexadecimal you have 15 digits. So, I'm sorry, 16 digits, 0 through F. Yes? Red, blue, green, in that order? Yes. Okay. Yes, red, gr red, green, blue, in that order. Oh, red, green, blue, RGB. The numbers vary from 0, 0 to FF. In hexadecimal, you represent the extra digits with letters. So you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. So F is the highest hexadecimal digit. All right, yes. I don't know anything about pain codes for cars. <laughs> so probably it's, it, 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 you know, it probably follows the same concept. I don't know if they use the same coding for it. You know what I mean? It's probably, yeah. Right. So these, these six digits will be These six digits will be starting at 0, 0 representing the lowest and FF representing the highest. So if I was counting in hexadecimal, I'd count 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5, 0, 6, 0, 7, 0, 8, 0, 9, 0, A, 0, B, 0, C, 0, D, 0, E, 0, F, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3. So again, it's just like decimal, where the, the higher digit is the, is the higher order, and then the second digit is the lower order. So, FF would be the maximum. 0, 0 would be the minimum. So, This would be the brightest red possible because I have all red, I have the maximum red, and I have no green or blue. So if I go in here and I put in If I go in here and I change that color to B, this will be the most red possible, maximum red. All right. What if I make it, oops, what if I make it AA, what will it be? It will be not as red, it will be a darker shade of red. What if I made it other way around, actually? All right. Um, 
this is the one thing that's a little different between pigment. There's a difference in physics if you're talking about the colors of pigments and the colors of light. This mimics light. Think of this again like the projection TV. All zeros means all three lights are turned off. And if all three lights are turned off, then the screen's going to be black. If all three lights are turned to their maximum, then the screen is going to be white. So all zeros equals black. All right? And all Fs equal white. What do you suppose this would be? Mm -hmm. Green and blue, right. Yes. What, 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 how would you describe what that's going to look like? No. No. In order for it to look greenish or bluish, the green or the blue would have to be higher than the other ones. All right. So what do you, what do we think it's going to be? It's going to be a shade of gray. All right. Because... Zero, zero, zero is everything off. It's going to be black. All Fs is everything on full blast. It's going to be white. So between white and black, there's a whole bunch of grays. So this will be a gray. All right. What if I made this this instead. Well, they're all equal, so it's going to be a shade of gray. All right. Will it be lighter or darker than the one that we saw a minute ago? It'll be darker because I've turned down these things. So if I look at this, it's closer to black. Now to your question, if I wanted sort of a and I don't know what the word would be, like a bluish gray, I might do something like A-A-A-A-C-C. -C. All right, it's kind of a grayish, but it has a distinct bluish tint to it. All right. Now, what if I wanted... What if I wanted purple? <laughs> yeah, I could. What if I wasn't sure how to spell purple, but I was an ace with hex codes? Granted, unlikely, but... Well, what's purple made of? There's some red in it. All right. Is there any green in purple? Is there blue in purple? So there's red and blue. All right, so red and blue together make purple. So if I do that, I will get purple. All right. Now, if I wanted a bluer shade of purple, what would I do? Well, I can't add more red or blue because red and blue are both at their max. So, if I wanted it to be bluish, what would I have to do? Take away some red. So, if I went like this, I'll lower red a little bit. And then this will be a bluer shade of purple. Yeah. No, they don't. Yeah, I, I could, I, yeah, they don't have to be the same. All right, I just, just for simplicity, do that. So, I could do a zero. And how does it work again? Well, A0 is less than A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, A7, A8, A9. And A0 is greater than 9F. So you go from 9F to A0. All right?
So that's bluer still. Now again, the good news here, the good news here is that it's like gravity. Even if you don't understand it, it works. All right? So, if I go and I see this color code, I could look at this and hot pink is that color. Well, would I have necessarily been able to guess that? No, but I don't have to guess that. I can go and just copy that and I get that shade. Now, where it comes handy to do that is if I look at this and say, I like that, but that's a little too bright. So I'm going to dim it down a little bit. So I might go in and make this instead of FF DD, I may make this 47. And I'm just I'm just guessing. But what I'm doing is I'm lowering all the numbers. Just to show you that if I don't like that color, I could tweak it a little bit to maybe get something that I like a little better. Or if I said, gee, I want this not to be quite as bluish, I could lower the blue to make it a little reddish, a little more reddish, and so on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Depending on the chart, again, this, this chart just shows these basic ones. Yeah, you could, do, you could do a lot of different things. Here is a color sorted by hex values. And this shows, doesn't show literally every, but it shows a wide range of this. Why doesn't it show every? It doesn't show every because... Um, how many color combinations are there? It would be 16 to the 6th power, I guess. Yeah, yeah, 16 to the 6th power, which is a big number. It's, it's in the millions. So if I go here and Google HTML hex codes, It shows a whole bunch of them. Now, what a lot of places do is they'll give you a color picker. Where you can go in and you can say, yeah, that's the one I want, and it'll give you the hex code. Oh, yeah. But we want to understand the concept first. We've got to make it hard, then you'll appreciate it when it's easy. This is even better still, because I can go in and I can pick and I can say, all right, let's say I want a very pale purple, and it will tell me that color. Or if I want to push this up to the red end of the spectrum or the green end, I can drag it around to get exactly the color. This, this indicates the intensity of it. This indicates the shade that I'm having. So you can sort of come up with whatever shade that you want from this. Now, what we'll look at next time is how to pick colors that go together. All right? Anyone that's seen me for more than two days realizes that I'm not necessarily the one to pick colors that go together, all right? Yet, as a web developer, I have to do that, right? I have to come up with colors that go together. Fortunately, a good part of picking colors that, quote, go together is not only human taste and human judgment, but there's science to it as well, all right? There's things like complementary colors and this, this, something you can actually like, quantify, all right? And there are color wheels that say, 
For fall, I want an orangish sort of color palette. Um, give me three or four colors that go together. The good thing is, is you don't want necessarily more than three or four colors and maybe white and black, right? If you start using too many colors, you get into the area of overkill, all right? Remember, we're not just using colors just to make it look pretty. We're using colors to give the user visual cues, visual hints about something that's different than the other stuff on the page or something that's important or stuff that's going to be grouped together. So our colors are not just for decoration. To be sure, we want our, our pages to look good and we want our pages to reflect what the content is. You know, I doubt we'll see a website for a heavy metal band in pink. All right? By the same token, I doubt we'll ever see Mattel make a Barbie site in all black. All right? So you're going to pick colors that sort of get your message across, sort of create a mood, but more importantly than that, they're, they're used to sort of group stuff together and organize the page and indicate importance and things along those lines. So that's where we'll pick up next time looking at um, picking good color combinations. Yes. 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 Yeah, that, that'll be one of the things that will come next, as a matter of fact, after we go over the, the colors. But yes. All right. That's all I had. We'll, we'll see it over in lab. Any questions in Ridgeville? Okay. All right. Excellent.